Good afternoon, and welcome to the third and final of our 2000, fall 2021 Kessler Conversations, opportunities to interview top Reformation scholars about how Martin Luther wrote and thought about the other, and how we, living in increasingly diverse communities, might learn to form more meaningful relationships with those who may look, live, and believe differently than we. My name is Bo Adams, and I have the privilege of serving as director of Pitt's Theology Library here at Emory University, the home of the Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection. I'm honored to welcome today as our guest, Dr. Dean P. Bell. Dr. Bell serves as the ninth president and CEO, as well as professor of history at Spurtis Institute for Jewish Learning and Leadership. The Spurtis Institute, based in Chicago, serves students and the broader public with graduate, certificate, and public programs that build community leadership and engage individuals in exploration of Jewish life. Prior to leading Spurtis, Dr. Bell has served on the faculty of DePaul University, Northwestern University, Hebrew Theological College, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the University of California at Berkeley. Trained as a historian of Jewish thought in the medieval and early modern periods, Dr. Bell has published widely on Judaism in the 15th and 16th centuries, authoring and editing a number of books that have helped define that field. Most notable is Dr. Bell's ability to connect his historical work with issues facing communities today, an ability that's easily recognizable in recent work on plagues from the past and what communities in a global pandemic can learn. And it's that very commitment to informing contemporary communities by looking to the past that made him the obvious choice to help us understand the complex and fraught relationship between Martin Luther and Judaism in the 16th century and the problematic reception history of some of Luther's most infamous writings. I welcome Dr. Bell today to help us understand what lessons, both positive and negative, we as citizens of the 21st century might learn from this past as we seek to engage more productively with those whose beliefs and practices may differ from our own. So Dr. Bell, thank you so much for your work and for taking the time to join us today. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and I'll return the favor by thanking you for all of the important work that you do and your institution does. It's remarkable and has made significant contributions to the field. So it's, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be here. Well, great. It's wonderful to have you. And I, I want to also welcome our guests who are joining us live online. A quick note for them. Um, as Dr. Bell and I talk over the next 45 minutes, if you have any questions or thoughts or feedback, you can enter those in the Q&A section on the right side of your screen. And as we have time toward the end of our session, I'll relay a few of those questions to Dr. Bell. And of course, I will pass along to him after the fact all of the comments and feedback we received today. So I encourage you very much to participate with us. So let's get started. And unfortunately, I wanna start with the negative. Let's just get it out of the way. So I think many of us recognize that Martin Luther wrote some terrible things about Jews and Judaism. A 1543 pamphlet entitled, quote, On the Jews and Their Lies certainly comes to mind as a low point. So can you just give us a broad introduction to what Luther said and wrote about Judaism in his career? Sure, I'm happy to do that. I'll start with a, a bit of a personal anecdote, which is I remember when I was doing research in Germany early on in my career and I was working on early Lutheranism and I had some Lutheran colleagues over for Shabbat dinner and they looked at me and they said, what's a nice Jewish boy studying Luther for? And uh, I didn't have a great answer in a certain way, in part because the narrative that you've just described is the one that's regnant not only um, in the broader Jewish communities, but also obviously in Christian communities as well. But as I reflected on their, on their question and the reasons why I find Luther and discussions about Luther so compelling uh, is that Luther himself was a multifaceted individual whose opinions could change over periods of time. He was somebody who had a a rich connection to language. And one of the things I've always loved about reading Luther is that sort of evocative language um, and imagery that he uses and the sort of powerful way with which he writes. Having said all of that, there are clearly a, a range of opinions that Luther expresses in a vast corpus of writings. And so um, to say that there is a specific view that Luther had of Jews and Judaism is a bit challenging because it did change in different contexts. We typically like to think that there was a more friendly, softer side of Luther early on in his career, and that became kind of hardened over a period of time, perhaps based on his experiences with Jews and Judaism, but more likely based on his experiences with his own polemical uh, situation, particularly with other reformers and with the Catholic Church as well. And Jews and Judaism became something of a foil for some of those deeper discussions um, at the same time. What I will say, though, is that the later writings we tend to hear quite a bit about, 
ironically in some ways, because these were writings that, while they did have an impact, uh, we know, for example, in the 1540s in Braunschweig, some of the attacks and the expulsion of the Jews were related to the circulation of Luther's writings. In many cases, these anti-Jewish writings, and there's sort of a trilogy or more of them at the end of his career, really didn't have an appreciable impact on Jewish-Christian relations, probably until the 17th century, when they were rediscovered and oftentimes republished, oftentimes in very short snippets. And so we do have to separate out the kind of impact of his writings and the flavor of them as well. But the other thing that I'd like to point out is that although we have this narrative of Luther becoming harsher when it comes to Jews and Judaism over the course of his career, there are some consistent theological messages that permeate all of his writings. And even as Luther changes his position about ministerial obligation and other kinds of things as he thinks through experiences that he's had, we do see some consistencies or some consistent motifs from the 15 teens all the way into the 1540s and even his last writings. Uh, I oftentimes like to say that some of the language and the, and the imagery that he uses become sharpened, but some of the underlying theological principles are not so different. So for example, one of the things we see in his later writings that I think is, is important for Luther's theology and, and broader discussions are criticism of his sense of Jews notion of chosenness which he often describes as being arrogant and being sort of inward looking and, and disparaging of others. Ironically, he uses this as a kind of a polemical straw against Jews when he wants to use it against Catholics and other groups as well. Um, what's different in some ways about his later writings, at least in, in the case of On the Jews and Their Lies, is that it appears to have very kind of practical implications. So he talks, for example, about restricting the movement of Jews, the professions in which they can engage, um, restrictions on what they can teach on their writings, potentially even burning or closing their synagogues. And while it's a very brief section of a very long treatise <clears throat> that really is more theologically focused, it's often that that gets pulled out and gets represented as kind of Luther's view on Jews and Judaism. And there's reasons for that. The, the Nazis obviously um, curated some of this material as well in a more popular vein, uh, but others did before that time too. What's interesting, though, is the audience and who he was writing for and the purpose for which he was writing the treatise. And this was really not about specific anti-Jewish animosity as much as it was upbraiding local rulers, princes in particular, and suggesting that they should be thinking a little bit differently about how they rule their territories and how they uh, oversee uh, their subjects and think about their own religious consciousness. So I don't want to suggest, because uh, I am fairly pro-Lutheran in a certain way, I don't want to suggest that Luther should get a pass simply because there's a broader context in which his work needs to be understood, or because different people can take his work and make different meaning out of it. But I do want to suggest that Luther does need to be understood in a particular context, and, and we can chat a bit about that as well. Uh, and so his later writings, in some ways, are a continuation of his early writings. That's been a trend in the scholarship more recently to suggest the continuity rather than the disruption. Um, but it does, it does lead to other questions about what things did subtly change and what things remained the same throughout much of his career. And Luther was somebody who wrote a great deal about many different things. And so you can imagine his vision and his reason for writing about certain topics did change in different contexts. So I don't know if that answers your, your question directly, but it, it does give a sense that the, the later writings are in some ways a continuation of earlier writings, even if they feel different in, in some particular contexts. No, I, that's very helpful. And I, I think particularly for my own uh, experience, like oftentimes the story is told, right, that Luther becomes a grumpy old man at the end of his life. And this is what feeds some of this, you know, and people will point to the 1520s. He wrote, you know, that Jesus Christ was born a Jew as a little bit more positive view. Um, and so I think it's an important distinction between the rhetoric harshens, but the kind of theological underpinnings of them are pretty consistent across the career. Um, so, yeah, no, that answers it directly. So thank you uh, very much for that. Um, you mentioned the importance of context, and so I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's important, you know, whenever we talk about Luther to place him within the kind of late medieval, early modern period, um, but particularly around this topic. So you wrote in, in an essay in Theology Today, you write, quote, it's impossible to understand Martin Luther's position on and writings about Jews and Judaism without exploring the context in which he wrote. So can you help us understand general Christian attitudes toward Judaism in this period and really, is, is Luther that distinct from some of his contemporaries who are writing in a Christian vein? Sure. <clears throat> I'll put on my, my consulting hat. Um, I, have a, I have a good friend at DePaul University who likes to say when he goes into consulting, he actually says a few things that are really interesting. Usually when he goes into a place, he says, 
uh, I want to understand what's going on here, what's really going on here, what's supposed to be going on here. And it sort of works in history sometimes as well. But the better quote, which is really about history, is content without context is pretext. And I feel oftentimes without creating that context for the content of Luther and other writers, uh, it is a pretext for either a supportive or a, 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 an apologetic on the one hand or a polemical kind of representation of Luther or other thinkers. And the truth of the matter is Luther is steeped in a society and a culture that is fundamentally anti-Jewish. Uh, anti, it's not anti-Semitic uh, in the kind of modern biological racist notion that we know from the 19th century, but it is anti-Jewish from the standpoint that Christianity is does view Judaism as being superseded by Christianity. The old dispensation becomes fulfilled in the new. And so the way that we think about Jews and Judaism is something that uh, may have importance and could be foundational, but is also being replaced. But added to that in a late medieval context are rather negative images of Jews who are cast as outsiders, but increasingly as criminals and folks who are uh, doing despicable acts. We have ritual murder accusation, host desecration accusations, criminal accusations. Um, and so there is a kind of general sociological cultural representation of Jews that is added to this theological representation of Jews that has a long medieval history in which Luther has to be understood. Um, now, there are, there are folks in Luther's cir circle, even including Philip Melanchthon, who in some ways were more tolerant towards Jews or at least dismissive of certain things like ritual murder, uh, though they were, ne they were not necessarily more positively inclined towards Jews in their own theological thinking. Uh, even Calvin, I think, comes into conversation quite a bit with, you know, very critical in some ways around economic issues, usury and other things, and yet fairly positive when it comes to a notion of, uh, of a kind of a tradition and of a continuity and of chosenness that, that Jews themselves might have had or Judaism represented. So, so Luther is really steeped in this kind of late medieval discussion. And one of the things that I think is important to consider is that Luther is also engaging with tradition in interesting ways. And he is representing um, sometimes consciously, sometimes I think subconsciously, a, uh, a response to the traditional church and society in which he's steeped. Those of us who work on early Luther know that, you know, in a certain way, he was never really looking to create a revolution or a movement or to separate. But as uh, he increasingly runs into political and theological uh, dire changes and challenges, he begins to rethink some of these things and moves in other directions. But he's very much somebody who's engaging with the traditions and the challenges around him. And, and we find that in some ways, the language that he uses sharpens uh, as he gets a little bit, uh, let's say, older or grumpier, I think, to, to quote you, uh, or gets engaged with other kinds of conversations where he himself is oftentimes accused of Judaizing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Luther himself, I think, oftentimes responds to this sense that He's too Jewish in a certain way because of the way he reads the Bible or the way that he understands uh, and emphasizes the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, and so when, when that happens, he, he becomes particularly aggravated, I might say. And so the language changes. But what's important to point out there is that the language that he uses in that kind of anti-Jewish sensibility is language that others are, are using in, in all of the camps uh, in these Christian debates in, in the early 16th century. And so from that standpoint, there's in many ways nothing particularly unique uh, about Luther's approach to Jews or Judaism. He's drawing from popular uh, ideas, popular representations, but a whole school and a whole tradition of theology that is grappling with questions of what does tradition mean? What does it mean to um, have a relationship to chosenness? What are the proper methods for interpreting the Bible and applying it in our own day? How do we think about people who have different religious ideas than our own? Uh, and whether or not they're right or wrong or somewhere in between, how do we engage with them? So from that standpoint, and I, I like to say that Luther is, a, is one of the least revolutionary revolutionaries I've ever met. Um, you can find all sorts of opinions in his vast writing, as I said, and sometimes it seems rather contradictory. Um, sometimes it feels like he changes midstream. But in this way, he's very much a person of his time. And, and I think you see that quite a bit in, in his works, particularly around Jews and Judaism. If it's okay, actually, I'll sort of combine the response to this question with the previous one by looking at a couple slides. Um, so when we, we talk about your earlier softer um, Luther, and particularly his treatise that Jesus Christ was born a Jew in 1523, oftentimes when we read these texts, we get a sense that this is the positive side of Luther. He was after conversion of Jews to Christianity, and uh, he held out some sort of hope that, in fact, Jews wouldn't would convert to Christianity. 
I, I think recent scholarship has suggested that these these treatises were not written for a Jewish audience, didn't really necessarily have any sensibility of mass conversions, and there's something else going on in the text. So let me just read this one to give you a flavor for it. In opposition to this, many people are proud with marvelous stupidity. And again, I just the, the sort of richness of Luther's language, even in translation, is wondrous. Uh, when they call the Jews dogs, evildoers, or whatever they like, well, they too and equally do not realize who or what they are in the sight of God. Boldly, they heap blasphemous insults upon them when they ought to have compassion on them and fear the same punishments for themselves. Moreover, as if certain concerning themselves and the others, they rashly pronounce themselves blessed and the others cursed. Such today are the theologians of Cologne, Catholic, who are so stupid in their zeal, or rather their inarticulate and inept writings that they say that the Jews are accursed. And so here this is in a certain way, if you read this, not really about Jews and Judaism at all. This is a kind of polemical lever that he's using in his debates uh, with others. And so, you know, the, the positive promotion of Jews and Judaism isn't exactly what we think it is. Or, or consider this one, another one of my favorites from the same treatise. Moreover, through the worship of Baal, there was depicted a monstrous form of righteousness and superstitious piety, which prevails widely to this day. By means of this, the Jews, heretics, and monks, that is, arrogant individualists, worship the true God according to their own idea with most ridiculous zeal. With their excessive piety, they are worse than the most ungodly. That is, for the sake of God, they are the enemies of God. So even in this kind of positive representation, there is this sensibility that Jews, like other groups, are overly ceremonial. They're caught up in their own traditions and their own authorities, and they're, they're sort of not really engaged in the world in the true way that Luther would like to see. And even before you know, that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, when we might have expected that Luther had very positive views of Judaism, consider, for example, his commentary on Psalm 78, already in 1519. God rejected the Jews altogether according to the flesh and killed the standing of the synagogue and put the law to death in which they nevertheless think they are living, but they are not alive before God. The fact that their sacrifices and ceremonies and works are dead, this God did with the word alone, for he removed them and determined that they should come to an end. But since they were unwilling, the wrath of indignation was sent upon them. So I give you this just as some sort of sense of not only the complexity of the positive writings about Jews on the one hand, but also that even in his early years, Luther had a very kind of general notion of Jews and Judaism that was part and parcel of the society and the culture in which he lived at the time. So it's a bit unfair to pull him out in some ways. Uh, he is representative. And yet, because of the influence and the scope of his writings, and I, I would say because of the animation with which he, he wrote them, uh, he gets extra credit in a certain way. <laughs> Well, no, no, that's really helpful. I mean, in, in many ways, right, he's taking uh, what is kind of contextual stereotypes and then applying them to his own argument that may not have anything to do with Judaism, as you point out, with the theologians at Cologne or, or, or whatever else group he's trying to go against. Do, do we have a sense? I mean, I, I know that he knew Judaism, as you referred to, in the sense of he knew the Bible well and he may have familiarity with some rabbinic writings. Was he familiar with contemporary Judaism? Did he interact with Jews at the time? So it seems unlikely that he had much interaction. There is a bit of debate in the scholarship about whether he met individual Jews. We do have some indication that he had individual meetings with Jewish leaders or Jewish thinkers, but probably not a very significant amount. Um, that having been said, he did live from time to time in places where there were Jewish populations uh, or would have had access to those. And there was certainly in the early 16th century, well into the middle of the century, an active kind of Christian Hebraic culture where he would have met folks who had experience or direct experience themselves or might have in fact uh, encountered Jewish thinkers in some ways. It's interesting even when we think about his use of Hebrew. Um, there are times when I'm reading Luther and I think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of impressed with this Hebrew. And then I, I sort of, I pull it back and realize, eh, maybe I shouldn't have been so quick to be impressed. Um, so I think he has some skills in those areas. I think he does rely on some scholarship. There are times when he's even more favorable to rabbinic writing, um, you know, in small doses, and other times where he just rejects it out of hand and talks about the fact that not only do the Jews believe the writings of the rabbis, but it's concerning that good Christian thinkers also reference them and think about their writings too. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know that he had a, a great deal of experience. Calvin, for example, might have had more direct experience just given where he lived and the sort of circles in which um, he was traveling. But he probably did have a little bit, you know, and in some ways, this is the, the, the medieval and early modern context for much of Jewish Christian relations. 
um, many of the stereotypes and many of the ideas that Christians con constructed of Jews were based on exactly that, stereotypes, images, ideas that were heard second, third, fourth hand, uh, or that came out of books uh, or sermons or discussions. And very rarely do we get a sense that there were individual kinds of interactions. Now, that having been said that, you know, my area of research tends to focus on Jewish history. And one of the things that's been really exciting to see is that as we have learned a bit more about popular history and the opportunities for Jews and Christians to interact in the 16th century and beyond, we do have a sense that there were day-to-day -day interactions and they weren't just about money lending. And oftentimes they were about, you know, neighbors extending recipes over the hedges and people meeting on a day-to-day -day basis on the streets, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. You know, the real challenge of history, of course, is that the, the sources that we have tend to point out when there were problems. Mm -hmm. And so we have plenty of examples of negative interactions, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in many places, potentially there were positive interactions and probably the norm as opposed to uh, the exception. Uh, so Luther, I think, has a bit of that. You know, he also has his own unique political career and his own, um, let's say, um, quarantining uh, that's forced upon him in some ways. And so his chances to have those interactions are probably much reduced in some ways. And I'm not sure at the end of the day if it would have made a difference necessarily. You know, in my read of Luther, much of the way that he thinks about Jews and Judaism serve a particular purpose, which is really shorn of the realities that um, he might have experienced or others might have experienced. Jews serve as a kind of a lightning rod, as an opportunity for him to think together with others and think by himself about big issues. And they're not always a straw man per se, though I think frequently they do serve that role, but they are oftentimes a prompt for him to think about other things. And so if we keep that in mind, it doesn't excuse what he says about Jews and Judaism when he's at his worst, but I do think it helps to explain why he engages with, with Judaism as a concept and with his notion of Jews. Now, I think he does make distinctions between contemporary Jews and let's call them Jews of history, particularly of the rabbinic and biblical period, the Israelites. And he, and he clearly has more of a negative representation of the contemporary Jews about him. Some have argued that's because of his experiences with Jews allegedly trying to convert Christians uh, to Judaism or with his concern with the Sabbatarians and other groups in Moravia and other parts, particularly in the 1530s and 1540s. Uh, but you know, again, I'm not sure that he had direct experience of that, but he certainly received a lot of correspondence from people who could have influenced the way that he thought about contemporary Jews uh, in a very real way. And so I think um, it's a complicated question, but probably he didn't have a lot of direct experience, but I'm not sure that that mattered um, because he crafted it in his own unique kind of ways. Yeah, no, that's great. You, you sh share the example of Luther's Hebrew, I, just an example here in the library a few weeks ago, we, we, we uh, acquired a piece by Karlstadt that had some Hebrew writing on it. And so we had three of us on staff who read Hebrew all trying to figure it out. We could not figure it out for the life of us. And we were very frustrated ourselves until we realized that Karlstadt had actually made a mistake and it was the wrong consonant. And so it didn't make sense anyway. Um, so it made us feel a little bit better that they too were struggling to learn uh, Hebrew. Uh, I would say in all fairness, it happens in rabbinic writings too, so you shouldn't worry. <laughs> Karlstadt wasn't alone. <laughs> um, well, thank you. I wanna to get to one of the points you just touched on, which is the kind of contrast between a um, practical concern with Judaism and a theological concern with Judaism. So in that article in Theolo Theology Today I referenced earlier, you say, quote, Jews themselves were not generally a practical concern for Luther. Rather, Jews and Judaism formed part of a larger theological problem for Luther. So I wonder if you could just parse that out a little bit more. I mean, there were obviously, as you said, practical implications for Jews uh, based on what Luther wrote. But is it can we wholesale say that it really is a theological question for him rather than a practical concern with those around him? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always hesitant to say things in wholesale. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think the vast majority of his writing really is of a theological nature and really doesn't deal with Jews in a practical way. Um, Jews for him serve as a kind of oppositional pole in some ways. And Thomas Kaufman, who's one of the great Luther scholars, but has written some really wonderful stuff on Luther and the Jews and Judaism has also suggested that in fact, Luther uses his discussion of Jews and Judaism as a way of getting at sort of deeper core theological kinds of issues. And so when we think, for example, of Luther's criticism of ceremonials, uh, which he, he goes on quite a bit about, um, he's using this as a way of defining what he thinks is proper Christian behavior and differentiating Catholic ritual and other kinds of, and sometimes in a more radical Protestant behavior as well. 
And so for him, Jews and Judaism serve as that kind of um, convening place where he can have discussions. You know, in a certain way, they, it becomes an easy place to have a discussion. I mean, Luther doesn't shy from controversy, let's be clear. But, but talking about Jews in the context of being critical of certain Christian practices or uh, competing Christian ideas um, is, is rather easy because the Jews for him represent a, a kind of idealized other in a certain way. Now, the, what Luther does that I think is really quite brilliant is that he, he incorporates other groups into that broad other category, and they vary from time to time. So when he's having discussions with the more radicals, he lumps them in together. And when he's having discussions about the Catholics, they, you know, they're sort of Ju Judaized in a certain way as well. And that is, I think, you know, uh, David Nuremberg uh, wrote a few years back a book on anti-Judaism in the Western tradition. And it, part of what David argues is that um, Judaism is core to a lot of Western thinking, and that's particularly true in Christianity more generally. And so there is a, there's a sort of rich engagement with Jews and Judaism, both in, largely in a negative, but sometimes in a, a positive or philo-Semitic way, because it's so central to a Christian identity and to a European sensibilities. And here, I think Luther shares that same kind of um, reality, that for him, Jews are representative of a variety of different things, and he uses them in different situations to surface those kinds of questions. So when he wants to talk about questions of chosenness and he wants to criticize the papacy, Jews fall into that kind of similar kind of vein. Uh, when he wants to talk about inappropriate economic issues and whether Jews are lending money at absorbent interest rates and the like, he uses that way of criticizing um, city councils or, or, or local princes or rulers and the like. So for him, I often get a sense that that when he uses the terms Jews and Judaism, they are interchangeable with other concepts. And so from that standpoint, they serve as this kind of theological foil for his discussions. Um, but it's a slippery one because it can change in different ways at different times. You know, when you read On the Jews and Their Lives, which is an enormous book, it's got the light, little tiny section that we always reference uh, when we think about our anti-Semitism courses. The rest of it is pretty standard stuff that he's grappling with. What does it mean to be arrogant? What does it mean to imagine that you know, we are grafted into the new olive tree. Um, what does it mean to have a relationship with God? What does it mean to have a covenant? And how does that change? So, you know, some of the big theological issues that he, he's, he's struggling with, I think, get to that. I, I was going to show a couple quotes, and maybe I can pull them up, related to his, it seems timely in a certain way, uh, his, his treatise in 1527 on whether one is allowed to flee from the plague. And here again, he doesn't reference Jews specifically uh, in most of this, but what he does talk about is the sensibility that there is a kind of sacred community that is created out of faith and commitment to others, particularly the neighbors that one might have. And oftentimes he refers to Jews as being outside of that. And so they become the outsider that is unneighborly in a certain way, not part of the gemine of the community. Uh, and so I'll just share quickly uh, those couple slides. I'll skip ahead actually uh, from a few of them. Just to get a sensibility, I always feel like anytime you can get plague into a discussion, um, <laughs> that it makes a lot of sense these days. So he writes in 1527, and again, this is in response to correspondence he's getting from friends and colleagues from around Central and Eastern Europe. It would be well where there is such an efficient government in cities and states to maintain municipal homes and hospitals staffed with people to take care of the sick so that patients from private homes can be sent there, as was the intent and purpose of our forefathers with so many pious bequests, hospices, hospitals, and infirmaries, so that it sh should not be necessary for every citizen to maintain a hospital in his own home. But it goes on, which is, I think, equally interesting. We can be sure that God's punishment has come upon us. And this is the typical way that many people at least tried to rationalize what was going on with pandemics uh, or other kinds of natural disasters as God's punishment, not only to chastise us for our sins, but also to test our faith and love our faith in that we may see and experience how we should act toward God, our love in that we may recognize how we should act toward our neighbor. And here I think, and the reason why I share this is that oftentimes Luther represents Jews as being outside of that kind of communal context. And so again, they serve as a, as a, as a galvanizing pole against which Luther creates the sense of what does it mean to be in community? What are our obligations to others? How do we think about our work in a, in a ministerial kind of context? Yeah, this is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just starting to see as we've kind of had these three conversations throughout the semester, all focused on the other, a, a kind of consistent stream here. So, for example, when we talked to Anthony Bateza about his kind of German nationalism and Luther, 
he refers to the Greeks or the Italians as a kind of other group to help form a German identity. And likewise, we talked to David Grafton about Luther's use of the term the Turk. And for him, he doesn't know any Muslims, but they are this kind of fear element on the borders, right? That you better get yourself in line, otherwise God's wrath is going to come to you in the form of the Turk. And so it seems similar, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in many ways, the Jews are also a kind of other that then allows him to form a new kind of Protestant Christian identity by speaking about the practices of a different kind of group. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, and the, there is some interesting work that's starting to emerge, which looks at characteristics that Luther ascribes to other out groups as well. And you know, certainly the Turks are a particularly good example. The difference, of course, um, when he's depicting Islam is that, you know, here we're talking about a civilization that has real impact and is at the doors of Christian society with military might and all that, where, whereas Jews are not a kind of military physical force in the same kind of way. The other difference, of course, is that Jews are resident within Christian Europe, where largely Muslims are not. They're on the, on the borders. So there are differences in the way that he thinks about these groups. And yet there are some um, consistencies that I think help him think about how one defines self through engagement with other. And I know at the end, we'll, we'll come back to some of the discussion about, is there value in Luther in thinking about interreligious engagement when he seems to be negative and using largely a construct to create a sense of his own identity, his own religious identity. But part of this is not only religious. And if you think about Germany in the 16th century uh, and Germans differentiation, not only regionally, but also particularly between Germans and Italians and Germans and other sort of proto-national groups, Luther here is drinking from and contributing to the same pool in which they're suggesting that difference is important and the way we define ourselves is by othering others. And sometimes those are through geographical boundaries, sometimes are those through language or a variety of different mores, sometimes they're through religion and religious observance and theology. So, so I think that these are all coming together in really interesting ways in Luther, <clears throat> some of them not planned, some of them emerging as he continues to have his own theological uh, thoughts emerging and changing, and some of it related to the political and religious landscape that is changing very quickly around him. And, you know, unlike others for Luther, I think he's living through an age in which there is a kind of acceleration in a certain way. We are on the cusp of modernity and Luther is grappling with a lot of new realities that are both political, but also intellectual and cultural. And so much of his changing landscape and some of the harshness with which we see his later writings, I think are related to how he's grappling with these significant changes. But it, you know, it has to do with a lot of elements. And you know, if Luther is quintessentially German in a certain way, uh, his othering is also about creating a German sensibility in addition to a Lutheran one. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to jump a little bit more to the present because I know a lot of your work is in service of fostering interreligious dialogue and learning about the past and how it helps us in the, in the present. I mean, one of the things that we've seen is that Luther is obviously a religious and cultural authority for many groups. Um, and, and then the question becomes, well, if that is the case, what do you do with someone who has deeply problematic parts within his corpus, right? Who we can't get him off the hook by saying it was just an interpretation of Luther. He wrote some really bad stuff. So, I mean, to share a library anecdote, every time we do an exhibition of Luther materials, um, we'll get comments on our social media that we're doing great harm because we're providing another platform for this anti-Jewish writer. And, you know, while we strive to show the full picture warts and all of Luther, our library does, by definition, engage in a little bit of Luther promotion and Luther worship. So how do you respond to that critique? Are the, are the flaws in Luther so great that we just need to say, enough of this guy, let's move on? Yeah, no, and being, a, in a certain sense, an outsider in this conversation um, has been really insightful and helpful. Uh, I remember back in, uh, 19, I was going to say 19, 2017, I wasn't alive in 1917, as far as I recall. Um, 2017, when we had the 500th anniversary of the 95 Theses, I got to participate in a lot of conversations that were of an interreligious nature. Inevitably, they began by having uh, me representing the Jewish position, uh, usually a Lutheran scholar talking about Luther. And it was always prefaced by um, the apologies of the church and rethinking of Luther's writings and how you know that has been a constant source of grappling, particularly over the last decade or so. And invariably, the Lutheran scholar was quite negative about Luther and would, uh, you know, obviously founding father and, and his writings are central to, to the faith tradition and yet really highly critical. And, and I sort of ended up being on the moderate side, uh, oftentimes defending Luther in a certain way, 
And it's not because I think that uh, Luther was necessarily a nice guy. You know, I, I would have liked to have had a beer with him, I think it would have been an interesting conversation. Um, but I'm not sure much beyond that. But, but what I would say in this context is that part of interreligious engagement is understanding yourself and your own faith tradition before you can engage with another. Uh, and to this extent, I'm not saying Luther was successful, but he was clearly, he was grappling with the sense of how to understand and define his religious tradition and his faith tradition as it was emerging. And sometimes the way we do that is by uh, demonizing or othering or castigating people who have different ideas. That itself is bad, uh, clearly, but in certain ways, it's the first step to beginning to have a conversation with the other. First, it means that you've come to some determination of what your own religious principles and ideas are. Second is, although uh, demonization might be involved, you're recognizing that there is an other out there. And I think, you know, Luther in his time, and certainly most people in the early modern period, wouldn't be able to have a kind of interreligious conversation in the way that we think about it today in a very positive way. But they were constantly engaged in interreligious conversations from a very polemical standpoint. But uh, opening up this concept that you can learn from Luther and the shortcomings and the ways that he tried to understand others in the service of understanding himself and defining, I think is an important first step. Uh, and it, it opens up the conversation for us to engage in a different way down the road. We have to take away that kind of animosity and the negative language and all these other things. But you know, I think as folks working in interreligious dialogue have pointed out, if you go into a conversation and don't fully understand your own tradition and aren't strong in it, you're not going to be a good advocate to have an open dialogue. Forget about whether you're defending your own position. You can't actually enter into a real conversation because you don't understand your own faith tradition. And I feel like Luther gives us, well, he wouldn't, I think, have been engaged in the way that we would like to today. Luther does give us the opportunity to say, well, what is involved to get past that kind of negative stereotyping, that othering, in order to have real dialogue and conversation? and not just the polemical piece of things. Uh, and I like to say, usually when I'm thinking about interreligious leadership, um, one of the things that comes up regularly is the, is the notion of vulnerability, how our own vulnerabilities have to be open and discussed. In a certain sense, Luther is hiding those and he's trying to compensate for them by othering others. But if in fact we wanna move forward, we have to be clear of what did you say, of the warts and all, right? What are what are the positive and the challenging aspects of our religious traditions that we need to bring into conversation with ourselves and with others? And so Luther doesn't solve the problem for me. In fact, he probably identifies the problem more acutely than many others, but it's because he does that that I think we're able to move forward a bit. And once we can get to that point where we feel comfortable in our religious faith tradition, uh, we can begin to question it as I think has been happening in the Lutheran church and the Lutheran tradition, where are those warts? Where are those problems? How do we reflect upon them? How do we keep something um, holy and sacred even when we see parts of it are problematic? Uh, you know, and they were maybe less problematic in a 16th century context than they are in a 21st century one, but they're problematic for us today. So how do we engage with those? And so I, I generally like to think about it, and I'll share a couple of texts with you that are more of a philosophical nature but in my mind, when we open ourselves to that kind of vulnerable position, which Luther was trying not to do, right? He's trying to become invulnerable in a certain way. But when we open that vulnerability, then I think we have the opportunity to advance discussions in, in much more productive ways. So I, I'm just gonna share a few uh, slides with you. of quotes that I come from very dispersed, uh, disparate uh, scholars, but I think raise some, some interesting questions. Judith Butler, who um, you know, has a complicated you know, politics and philosophical position, but I think has done some really remarkable work, has this very nice thing in, in her book on violence, mourning, and politics. She writes, I find that my very formation implicates the other in me. And I oftentimes think that Luther, in fact, has this as the kind of core, uh, defining who he is and who his religion is by grappling with the other within and the other without that my own foreignness to myself is paradoxically the source of my ethical connection with others. Um, and there have been obviously psychological studies of Martin Luther, young man Luther and the like, Eric Erickson, but, but I do think that Luther is a complex figure. And so what makes him interesting is not only his theological thinking, but also his own personality. Uh, Butler goes on to write, I'm not fully known to myself because part of what I am is the enigmatic traces of others. And in a theological perspective, that has some resonance. In this sense, I cannot know myself perfectly or know my difference from others in an irreducible way. 
Uh, and again, I think this gets at some of these really interesting complications. I'm going to skip this one. I'll move to one final one. Uh, Aaron Gilson is a really interesting uh, theologian of ethics. I uh, writes that thus by opening oneself up to others and their effects on the self, one is also open to transformation in relation to these others. Receptivity, non-closure, and self-dispossession endow one with a gift of changeability. Now, Luther himself probably wouldn't have admitted so much changeability, but the truth of the matter is when you read his writings, he's pretty changeable. And he's, he, he does flow in terms of his, um, his arguments and his responses to what's going on around him. Uh, Gilson continues, openness to experiencing alterity and altering in relation to it is the condition of invention. Mobility and inclusiveness makes one stronger and yet more fragile at the same time. So Luther would never have thought in these kind of postmodern and I think you know very open philosophical ways. And yet, to your question earlier, Luther, I think, does provide a platform for how we interrogate what otherness means to us, how we engage with it, and ultimately, hopefully, how we, how we change the way that we do that. Uh, Luther wouldn't have done that, I think, in 1546 on his deathbed. But, uh, but I think we can learn from those kinds of experiences and the conversations that have happened since then and the ref reflection and almost the sort of reconciliation that we try to have with Luther and his texts uh, in a contemporary age. So unfortunately, it sounds like we have to wrestle with these hard texts and continue to do this really hard work to kind of know where we come from, we being Christians in this particular perspective, but um, and, and to know who we are and, and, and how to engage with that. I think that's really helpful yet challenging. So thank you, I guess. Would be... <laughs> <laughs> Let me, um, we have a couple of questions that are coming through, which I certainly want to get to, but I want, I want to first ask a kind of selfish theological library question, if I will. Um, so we're a rare book library. We spend a lot of time. We spend a lot of resources collecting this old stuff. Um, we live in a digital age. And so oftentimes people say, what's the value of collecting the old stuff? Shouldn't it all be scanned and put up online? So can I, as a researcher, can you speak about your experience with libraries um, and kind of validate, I hope, uh, the work we do and talk about the importance of, of preserving, collecting and promoting these original sources? Yeah, sure. And I think there's there's obviously a range of materials that libraries and archives collect. And they have different value in different ways. Uh, I'll share when I was uh, early on in my career, when I was working on my dissertation, I was in the archives in South Germany and the, the head of the library came up to me and they said, you know, we have this uh, box of documents about Jewish prostitutes in the 14th century. And I was like, wow, bring it on. Like, I, I feel a dissertation topic emerging. Uh, and then they brought me this box of documents that were typed. And I, I said, you know, I, I don't have that much experience, but I don't think there were typewriters in the 14th century. And they mentioned that because of changes where they had to move the library and the archives and they had to downscale, they ended up um, typing up some of these things and, and so that they would have copies of them. I said, well, that's great. Where are the originals? They said, well, we, we can't find them anymore. I said, well, so much for the dissertation topic because mm -hmm. these aren't documents that I can use. I use that as one example to say that um, what we get out of documents and original manuscripts and books that are in libraries like yours that are so valuable is that we actually have those tangible materials upon which we can do our scholarship. And, you know, internet resources are wonderful, but at the end of the day, those aren't the documents. Those are representations of documents. They might be true. They may not be true. They might be created in different contexts, but actually to have the physical manifestation of that, that if we want to, we can trace and see how old it is based on the paper and the ink and everything else. That's sort of one element that I think is important. There is uh, an objectivity and a, and a kind of presentness that is av available in our libraries that we can't find in other things. But there's other ways that I oftentimes think about these, because I know in many cases uh, in our own rare book room here at Spurtis, but in other places I've been, uh, you open up a manuscript or a print early printed work and there's commentary in it. There's people who have written notes on the side marginalia that oftentimes we can identify who wrote it and what context for what purposes. Um, you see underlinings you see a text that are actually alive in ways that um, you wouldn't know if you were simply looking at a printed book that has been published in the last 20 years or something online. There is something in, in the libraries that gives us that space to have the discussion. Uh, Tony Grafton and others have really done some great work on marginalia and other things, but, but it's even beyond that. It's, it's, it's having that kind of connection and sensibility with the materials. Uh, one of the reasons I like to share with friends of mine that I got interested in the Reformation and, and late medieval and early modern history is that I was once at a lecture by a person who was really formative in my work when I was an undergraduate, Constantine Fazold. Uh, 
and he was uh, he was giving a lecture on Italian uh, manners books uh, from the late 15th century. And he would read things like, you shouldn't pick up this smelling thing and tell people how smelly it is. Rather, you should just, you know, keep it to yourself or you shouldn't blow your nose on the tablecloth. And people were laughing hysterically. And he said, you know, it's, it's interesting that you're laughing because these weren't intended to be funny. Mm -hmm. um, and so what does that tell us about our distance from the culture that created these products? And in a similar way, when I think about libraries, we end up closing the distance between the world that's being represented in these documents and these materials and our own. And we do that in a really visceral, tangible kind of way. And, and so for me, it has, there's so many layers of this um, opportunity to engage with that world in a way that feels uh, genuine and uh, deep uh, and, and in a way that I think you can't have outside of the original materials uh, in any stretch of the imagination. Forget the scholarship side for, for a moment, but, but the sort of the, 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 the individual connection in a very personal way. So I, I think it's a shame when we don't support our libraries or archives and we, you know, we, we don't spend time in person in them where you get to meet others who are working on similar materials or, you know, one of my favorite stories at University of Chicago with OpenStax, when you go in there, you're looking for one thing, but you find five others that you never would have found if you were doing a search online because, because the collection is curated in a certain kind of way, sometimes um, by accident, sometimes with real intentionality, but it brings together things in ways that you might not have imagined. So in my estimation, there are no more valuable places than our libraries and our archives. And if there's anybody who's participating today, they should support all the work that you do generously. I hope <laughs> and everyone didn't heard that. I'm going to pull a lot of quotes from what you just said. So uh, thank you for that. We didn't arrange that in advance. So that's uh, lovely. Um, let me quickly, the last few minutes, jump into a couple of questions that have been asked from the audience. One related to something you were just saying. So Eric Madsen asks, how long did it take for Jewish thinkers to engage with Luther's work? And what was the reception of Luther like, I guess, in that early period of interpretation? Yeah, they, there, there's not a lot of early engagement with Luther. Yossel of Rosheim and others, um, very few of them are actually engaged. And usually it's, it's to the extent of trying to have Luther's writings blocked. Uh, that was true of Antio Antonius Margarita, a famous convert from Judaism as well. It's probably not until we get to you know, 18th, early 19th century that we see Jewish thinkers who are engaging with Luther in any substantive, substantive ways. And those tend to be more positive. Uh, they see Luther as a kind of um, iconoclast, somebody who is breaking tradition, who's thinking differently. And he's oftentimes presented fairly positively in Jewish writings, particularly in the 19th and into the early 20th century. So there isn't a lot of actual engagement in a theological way with Luther's writings, at least amongst um, Jewish thinkers that we have. There are some negative you know, representations. Luther is oftentimes uh, characterized as lo tahor, lauter, um, but lo tahor in Hebrew meaning impure, right? So Luther is the impurity, the embodiment of impurity. So there are negative representations and particularly amongst Jews who are under um, the protection of the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor, uh, they, they certainly would have found uh, it easier to side with uh, Catholics in this sort of uh, debate with Luther. Than Luther, although I think early on, uh, some Jewish thinkers and some Jewish communal leaders had a sense that maybe Luther was opening up things and it could be good for the Jews. I think that notion dissipated fairly quickly. But in terms of, of actual engagement on an intellectual level, there's not a lot written, certainly before the end of the 18th century, about Luther on a Jewish perspective. Thank you. I'll ask one more. So Rod Hunter asks, did Luther have an occasion or occasions when he could make a public response, either positive or negative, to incidents where Jews had been victims of physical violence and persecution? So did he address practical things that were happening to Jews? Uh, he did in, in, on, on some occasions uh, towards the end of his life. They weren't generally positive, uh, unlike Melanchthon, for example, who could come out against ritual murder accusations and, and sometimes disagreed with Luther more generally. Uh, we don't see that Luther comes out in any kind of real positive way, at least that, that I can recall. But he does have some occasions where he is clearly responding to contemporary events. I mean, Luther himself is in some ways um, separated out from a lot of the society and a lot of readers uh, who might be looking at his materials. And so, you know, one of the things that often happens in the scholarship is that we say Luther himself didn't have such an impact because he wasn't out there uh, on the road, as it were, <laughs> like some theologians might have been who were either rabble-rousers or supporters in a more um, Christian Hebraic or philo-Semitic kind of way. So, so there's a little bit of that, but not a lot. Um, and much of what was going on uh, amongst his circle um, didn't necessarily agree with his own position. We know a number of early Lutherans um, 
Oziander, for example, in Nuremberg and others are, are actually much more tolerant of the idea of Jews and Judaism uh, and, are, and reject some of the anti-Jewish motifs that they've inherited from the later Middle Ages uh, when Luther himself seems to embrace some of those. So he does have some opportunities. They're, they're infrequent and generally he is, uh, I think, pretty, uh, pretty true to his representation and his theological writings uh, in his political work as well. Well, with that, I think we're at time. So we have a few more questions that I will certainly pass along. Um, we will also compile a bibliography of uh, works that Dr. Bell has mentioned, uh, as well as any other recommendations he has for future reading uh, on this particular topic. Um, but Dr. Bell, thank you so much for your work, uh, for the conversation today and all that you continue to do. Um, I want to thank everybody who's been with us, uh, either live or who will watch us uh, into the future. Uh, I remind you that this is the third of three series or three conversations we've done this fall, but we've been doing this for some time. So if you visit pitts.emory.edu slash Kessler Conversations, you can see all of the conversations that we've done, uh, and we look forward to continuing this next semester. So thank you all. Uh, have a great day. Stay safe. And uh, thank you for your interest in Pitts Theology Library.